Something that's the most overlooked part of your environment, part of your visual presentation, it's the sky. Change to the sky and all of its dependent components have the ability to change your landscape from one significant emotional tone to a completely different experience for the viewer without touching the base geometry, without touching the materials, without touching the textures. The tone that we present visually has a tremendous impact on the emotional experience of the player. Video games can provide us with an escape to some of the most beautiful worlds we can imagine, brought to life by the work of myriad artists and programmers. And like our own Earth, the worlds our favorite video game characters inhabit are closed systems, wrapped up in an often overlooked element of video game development, the skybox. Now, skybox itself is something of a ubiquitous term for any 2D or 3D environment beyond the reach of the player character, though in modern times these environments can be spheroid, cuboid, or any other shape an artist might want to use. And today I want to take a minute here to do my best to track the history of how we got from 2D games with very basic sky backgrounds to something like this. The funny thing is, I only noticed skyboxes after I became interested in skyboxes. I used to play fast-paced games where I didn't have the time to look around at anything besides my target, so I never knew there was a thing called a skybox. I wonder if it's similar for most players, where they don't really notice the skybox? Unless it is striking, it is easy to miss, as it's just a background after all. But for some games, skyboxes make statements, and that's what I love to see when I play games these days. During video gaming's formative years, 2D game development dominated the market. I'm not tech-savvy enough to know if that was purely because of hardware limitations, or perhaps because many developers viewed video games as the philosophical successor to traditional board games, but whatever the reason, 2D reigned supreme. And the bulk of these 2D games were displayed with what are known as raster graphics. Now, a, a raster image is any type of digital image that uses rectangular pixels arranged in a grid to represent said image. Many of the games developed in this style would today be known colloquially as pixel art games. But as technology continued to advance, a few developers decided to try their hand at a new method of graphical display vector graphics. In contrast to raster graphics, vector graphics were generated not from individual pixels, but from geometric shapes. One of the earliest recorded examples of a game developed by this method is Jim Barry's 1974 Space Sim, a first-person, multiplayer space flight simulator that ran on the Pluto computer system. In a sprawling retrospective on his time programming for the Pluto system in the mid-70s, Bowery describes the collaborative efforts between him and his contemporaries developing games for this system like a kind of programming gold rush, as with the release of each new game onto the system, it would only be weeks or even days in some cases before another, more exciting game was published for the Pluto system. But once Bowery had worked out his first 3D graphics engine, laying the foundation for Space Sim, it was a whole new ball game. As one might imagine, it was a very exciting time. To see a dynamic mathematical space open up in full perspective visuals for the first time was an intoxicating experience. As most authors must experience when they're possessed of their muse, it felt like I was simultaneously creating and discovering a new universe. But this was even more captivating and visceral. And this, then, was the first step toward the kind of 3D environments we're familiar with today. Now, in 1975, in Kearney Mesa, California, one year after the release of Space Sim, Dennis Party and Gary Garrison founded Cinematronics Incorporated, a soon-to-be leader in the development of vector-based arcade games. Three years and several stints of complicated business history later, Party and Garrison's shares of Cinematronics had been bought out, and under the new leadership of Jim Pierce, Tom Stroud, and Larry Rosenthal, Cinematronics introduced their first vector-based arcade title to the market, Space Wars. Adapted from Steve Russell's 1962 space combat game Space War for the PDP-1, Cinematronics' spin on the title became the highest-earning video game of 1978 and allowed Cinematronics to continue development of similar titles. Space Wars' success also prompted Larry Rosenthal to split off from Cinematronics to create his own company, Vector Beam, and with it his own vector-based games like 1979's Speed Freak and Tail Gunner. Vector Beam never quite reached Cinematronics' level of financial success, though, and it was soon bought up by the very company from which Rosenthal had seceded. 
However, Cinematronics and Vectorbeam's hardware successes had caught the attention of Atari, who tasked Cyan Engineering, their Grass Valley, California-based subsidiary and developers of the Atari 2600, to get to work on a new vector-based system Atari could use to make their own games. Atari called this new system Quadriscan, and in 1979 released their first two Quadriscan titles, Lunar Lander, and Asteroids. The smash hit success of the latter title prompted Atari to begin brainstorming new ways to use the Quadriscan system, and soon it was decided that with it, they'd try developing a 3D vector-based game. The result was 1980's Battlezone. In Battlezone, we see Skybox development take another big step forward. On the horizon of this tank warfare battlefield, there are a handful of mountains and a moon, setting Battlezone in a specific place rather than a nondescript black void. In the same year, Atari would also release Red Baron, a 3D flight simulator that used the same Quadriscan technology as Battlezone, and like its predecessor, the world of Red Baron also featured mountains on the horizon. But as the 80s went on, vector-based games like those made by Cinematronics and Atari would become fewer and further between as advancements in raster graphic hardware accelerated. By the mid-80s, raster graphic games were beginning to pull off a kind of 2.5D effect, where, through clever manipulation of the scale of various 2D elements in their games, developers were able to achieve the impression of movement in three dimensions. However, there were still significant advancements being made in the development of proper 3D game engines. In the mid-1980s, British developer Jeff Crammond began writing a custom graphics engine for a new 3D action game. This game would become 1986's The Sentinel, and featured worlds generated from solid 3D elements. Though such graphical advancements came at the expense of player movement, players could not freely move around the world of The Sentinel, only teleport from location to location. Even so, The Sentinel was a monumental achievement, and a huge step toward the kinds of 3D worlds we're familiar with today. But even as The Sentinel hit the market, elsewhere in the UK, brothers Ian and Chris Andrew were working in-house at Incentive Software on a 3D game engine more ambitious than anything that had been made before, and by 1987, they were ready to reveal it to the world. For the first time, you can explore a solid three-dimensional environment with complete freedom of movement. You can move to any point in three-dimensional space and then look in any direction and see the view as if you were actually there. The engine was called Freescape, and like Crammon's custom engine for the Sentinel, Freescape rendered its environments out of solid geometry. But unlike the Sentinel, games built in the Freescape engine allowed full 3D movement for the player. The first game built with the engine was 1987's Driller, or Space Station Oblivion, as it would be known in the States, a game about piloting an excavation probe around an alien moon. And though its gameplay looks quaint from today's perspective, reviewers at the time couldn't get enough of it. Crash Magazine, a now long-defunct magazine dedicated to the ZX Spectrum, reviewed Driller and said that, The graphics are amazing. For once, the claims made by the publisher are surpassed, and Freescape really is the new dimension. With Freescape's tools firmly in their hands and Driller's rave reviews fueling their tank, Incentive Software would release two new Freescape titles, Darkseid and Total Eclipse, in the next year. But for all the advancements made in actually crafting truly 3D worlds, Incentive's first three Freescape titles all fall into the same camp of previously developed 3D games like Crammon's The Sentinel or Muse Software's 1978 Maze Game, in that their skyboxes, if such a thing were even programmed into the games, were solid colors or great but with Incentive's fourth Freescape title, 1990's Castle Master, we see a glimpse of a world beyond. A world not just of solid colors. Off in the distance beyond Castle Master's titular castle are mountains, providing the player with a little more detail about the world in which the game takes place. And back in the arcades, similar advancements had been occurring. Atari's 1989 Hard Drive-In featured a similar 2D mountainous vista a year prior to Castle Master. And yet, as other developers began making their own 3D games, many of them began setting their titles indoors. 1992's Wolfenstein 3D and Ultima Underworld fall into this camp, and the trend continued through the mid-90s with games like Parallax Software's 1995 Descent. However, coming off the success of Wolfenstein 3D was id Software, who, in 1993, brought us arguably the most famous first-person shooter of all time, Doom. It's here we first begin to see 
definition in the skybox. Not only is there more detail than in previous skyboxes, there is also depth. Much like Castle Master's Mountains, the Doom skyboxes gave players a better sense of the world in which the game took place. We begin to see skyboxes being used as an additional storytelling element. Now, I spoke to several devs and Skybox artists during my research for this video, including Respawn Entertainment senior Skybox artist Han Hee Lee, who told me that the biggest role of a Skybox is to establish the mood of the level. And in Doom, that is certainly the case. 1996 would bring id back into the spotlight with Quake, which featured one of the first animated skies. Though still not a sky box by any modern standard, Quake's animated sky textures were a quantum leap toward modern skyboxes. Quake was not the first, but one of the first true 3D engines. Quake was the first game that I remember ever seeing with true 3D worlds where you could pitch the camera up and down and nothing was faked. And it wasn't until a couple of years after that that people figured out the technique of basically creating a sphere that is essentially attached to the camera. That's from a conversation I had with Dead Space 2 creative director and longtime game dev veteran Wright Bagwell. Wright told me that these skyboxes were essentially saran wrap pulled over every bit of the level where, quote, the sky was authored by just placing blocks above and around that geometry and placing a special sky texture on them. But that was only the beginning. 1996 also introduced players to the first 3D Mario game with Super Mario 64, and it's in here we can see a glimpse of the modern skybox that Wright mentioned, where the game creators attach the whole dome or box of the sky to the player camera, keeping it that perfect distance away at all times. And games then throughout the 90s would use similar methods for creating the skies of their worlds, but then a seismic shift in 2001 cracked the dome of skybox development wide open a seismic shift called Halo. Throughout the 90s, even games with the most robust skyboxes were still essentially just paintings, 2D images or layers of images off in the distance that, though they might give the impression that the game you were playing took place in just a small part of a greater world, were still mostly sterile. The sky, when it could be seen, was fascinating and evocative, but the sense of artificiality was palpable. And then in 2001, Halo smashed out of the mold of its 1990s predecessors and rocketed the development of skyboxes into a new era. Halo begins, as a contemporary fan of the genre might have expected, in a labyrinth of corridors aboard a massive spaceship. This was the kind of environment FPS aficionados of the 90s would have been accustomed to, tight industrial environments full of baddies ready to be gunned down. This was Doom, this was Quake, this was Descent, this was Star Wars Dark Forces, this was Goldeneye, and as players hopped into the Pillar of Autumn for the very first time, this was Halo. The spaceship is boarded, the order to abandon ship is given, and your escape pod rockets down to the surface of the nearest celestial body, the titular Halo. And it is in this moment that Halo Combat Evolved shows its hand as you emerge onto the Halo ring and are met with one of the most astounding skyboxes in video game history. This place was spectacular and awe-inspiring, but also infinitely more tangible than anything that had come before it. It felt like it could be a real place, even as fantastic as it was. I spoke to Epitasis Games founder and longtime Halo modder Lucas Gavados about what made Halo's skies so fantastic. The Halo ring, for example, that's actually all geometry out in the distance. That was one of the first games I took seriously playing as a kid. I think literally the level Halo, like you come out of that life pod and you just you just look around and like the first thing you see is a giant beam shooting up in the sky and it really just, it forces you to look up and kind of just appreciate it. Now by bringing real 3D geometry into the skybox, Halo gave its worlds weight and dimension. Suddenly, implied distance was real distance. A mountain off on the horizon was something you could imagine yourself actually traveling to. But beyond that, Lucas told me that Halo's skyboxes actually helped to define the lighting conditions of each level. The skybox itself controlled how the level itself was lit. So in the skybox tag, as what it was called, basically just the settings for it, you could go in and change like how the lighting was built throughout the levels, the sun color, shadow color, stuff like that. A great example is uh, Truth and Reconciliation. That level it's, it's night, but if you look up at the Halo ring, you can actually see daytime like on the other side, and all of that is simply in the Halo ring texture. 
true 3D engines were a game changer for Skybox development and implementation. At the same time Halo was being developed, EA Redwood Shores, soon to be known as Visceral Games, was working on a James Bond game called Agent Under Fire. It was the first game that I had worked on where there was an actual 3D Skybox. Once they moved to True 3D, the progression of the amount of detail in the skyboxes was less related to figuring out how to do it. One of the things I remember that we did that I thought was kind of fun on that game is that there was this one level that took place on an aircraft carrier, and I actually scripted the skybox to slowly kind of rotate like this, just sort of on a sine wave. And that gave you the impression that the boat was rocking because the skybox is attached to the camera, but wobbly and just so slowly to make you believe that the ship was moving once again. The pace of Skybox development would continue to accelerate over the next two decades. Soon we began to see dynamic skies with evolving cloud layers and full day-night cycles, or, or skies whose appearance changed completely based on certain game conditions. One thing I noted from all the developers I interviewed and articles I read for this video was that the tools for making these digital worlds are constantly evolving and improving, so who knows what kind of skies we'll be exploring beneath within the next few years. I truly can't wait to find out. From when I was a kid, I used to stare at the sky and wonder what lies beyond that sky. The fact that the clouds and the sun and the stars are all so far away makes us want to imagine things about them and awaken a sense of wonder in us. Now, if you liked this video, please give us a thumbs up and click the subscribe button so we can continue making more videos like this one. And now, what are, what are your favorite skyboxes? Let us know down in the comments. As always, I'm Jake Terrio, and this has been another episode of Subpixel Spotlight.